Hello and welcome to the 16th episode of Karl Marx's 18th premiere of Louis Napoleon Reading Group series. Today is Wednesday the 11th of November 2020 and I'm your host Tom O'Brien. We continue on our merry way through Chapter 5, The National Assembly versus Bonaparte. This episode has been released a few days late due to real life getting in the way. However, don't worry, I'll be cramming in some episodes over the coming week or two to make up for the delay. This week, I have the new patrons Christoph Ruprecht and Carl Shepard to thank. If you like the show, perhaps you too could become a patron. For only five bucks a month, you get access to the Patreon episodes back catalogue, two episodes and live streams every month, and access to the Emancipation Network Discord. This week, the patrons will get a chance to vote on the choice for the next upcoming reading group series. So if that's your bag, head on over to Patreon and throw us a few bob. Okay, let's rejoin the discussion. I mean, there's also one thing people haven't figured out is the whole, like, what if everyone was blaming everything on lockdown? And I feel like that was quite a lot of the reasons for for optimism, that the thought was when states do their reopening things, people are just going to resume the behavior that they had. Yeah, but that wasn't true in South Korea or in Sweden. Like, our Swedish compatriots aren't here, but, like, they had service sector problems, too, without the lockdown. Because people don't go out when you fucking has a chance to kill grandmother. Like, they just don't. <laughs> <laughs> like, Even in the UK and the US, like, people were taking quarantine measures way before the government did ever did anything. Yeah, right. it was. It came from the people in the UK. The government was forced by pretty much public pressure that they gave into it. Yeah, um, it was similar here, actually. I, like, it, it was a state-level public pressure. Trump only started weighing into it. Really, it does, it does depend, though, on what type of granny you have, though, Derek. That's what you, you gotta you gotta admit that. Well, I mean, uh, like, I I have a story about that, but I'm not gonna get into it. Well, <laughs> I mean, I, to be completely fair, I think we've all decided that there's something worth sacrificing Granny for now, and it's not just the economy. It's the communist revolution, baby. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, but but I mean, let's not go there. One of the things this premier is bringing is bringing up to me though is like what happens in a time of of real capitalist chaos when the capitalists can't lead. And so whatever faction can rise up will. And uh, this is what Wayne Price was saying. Wayne Price said that um, Marx was leaning towards the Lasallian and social democratic view around the Brumaire, that the state was not a truly class organ, or he was at least struggling with it because of the rise of Louis and Napoleon and his suppression of bourgeois elements. And the bourgeois element's own reversion to prior norms. You know, they basically undid everything they promised. I don't think that's true. Like, I don't think Marx gave up on the class notion of the state. But it is interesting that in these periods of chaos, where the bourgeoisie really don't seem to be in control, or like you don't have the right kind of bourgeoisie for control, right? Like, they're just, they're PR men, they're salesmen, they're service sector people. They're not people who've had to manage masses of people in that kind of way and produce something and have that kind of... But, like, one thing I would say, Derek, there is, like, that I I don't think the bourgeoisie would have allowed or been as complacent about, like, a radical leftist if that's what Bonaparte was. You know, it's only that, you know, he was a kind of bit of a schemer, but he wasn't interested in, in upending the system. That, like, this this idea for whichever is organized, it tracks right. And remember that Bonaparte still has finance behind him at this point. The financiers are behind Bonaparte. Yeah, we're going to get onto that in a while. He gets his his, his financier, uh, is it Fauché, into his cabinet by the end of this chapter. One of the things that's interesting to me is finance is not siding with Trump. So they're talking to this. So that's another difference. Like finance, it, what, what about the UK? How is Johnson siding with finance? finances essentially doesn't mind him like they didn't like brexit finance didn't but once it happened they kind of got over it fairly quickly so now they're fo- totally fine with the tories well i, ha- I have the feeling that, like in the united states finance is split between i mean they're basically happy with either side as long as they think they can control them and they effectively can i mean look at who they always stock but that's the sector of our economy that does like tends to cozy up to the executive the most is finance and that's even true for the left-wing economy, too. I mean, like, not the radical left, but the center left. I mean, like, finance kind of likes MMT, I think. 
Yeah, there's all these, you know, Ray Dalio and all these fuckers coming out with uh, stuff about how government spending, government deficit spending is good. And Soros is, you know, a major funder of MMT economics and obviously comes from finance. He's, he's, yeah. he's like uh, got a whole institute that he's, he's, he's funding. It's like one of the it's one of the few places where you can get funding if you're a heterodox economist. Oh, this is oh, that's right. It's INESH, Institute for New Economic Thinking. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's that's right. I forgot about that. Yeah, they are very post Keynesian friendly. Yeah, if if you're if you're heterodox or mostly post Keynesian, then that's where you're going to get your money. Well, all I'm saying is that like I had Stephanie Kelton on as a guest way back in like. I don't know, 2013 or something. If Bernie had got in, I would have had an in with the Treasury Secretary. Lads, the podcast numbers could have been flying. It could have been what drove the communist revolution. Not these wishy-washy protests on the street, but that interview with Stephanie Kelton. So um, leftist grift as revolution returns in the Bernie bros of the world. Is that what lives on in our heart? Oh, yeah, baby. Bring it on. (laughs) Bring it on. I'm telling you, the grift... The grift has been on show the last couple of weeks. Something wicked. Let's let's move it on. Will we move on to these couple of these paragraphs? Meanwhile, Bonaparte hastened to remove the war minister Hutput, to pull him off in all haste to Algiers, and to appoint General Scram, war minister in his place. On November twelfth, he sent to the National Assembly a message of, of American prolexy, overloaded with detail redolent of order, desirous of reconciliation, constitutionally acquiescent, treating of all and sundry, but not the burning questions of the moment. As if in passing, he made a remark that according to the express provisions of the Constitution, the president alone could depose the army. The message closed with the following words with great solemnity. Above all things, France demands tranquility, but bound by oath, I shall keep within the narrow limits that has been set for me, As far as I am concerned, elected by the people, owing my power to it alone, I shall bow to its lawfully expressed will. Should you resolve at this session on a revision of the Constitution, a constituent assembly will regulate the position of the executive power. If not, then the people will solemnly pronounce the decision in 1852. But whatever the solutions of the future may be, let us come to an understanding so that passion, surprise, or violence may never decide the destiny of of a great nation. What occupies my attention, above all, is not who will rule France in 1852, but how to employ the time which remains at my disposal so that intervening period may pass by without agitation or disturbance. I have opened my heart to you with sincerity. You will answer my frankness with your trust, my good endeavors with your cooperation, and God will do the rest. The respectable, hypocritically moderate, virtuous, commonplace language of the bourgeoisie reveals its deepest meaning in the mouth of an autocrat of the Society of December 10th and the picnic hero of Saint Mar and Sartori. Which is funny, right? Because I get the, I get the feeling that if Trump talked like this, the Democrats would actually kind of like him. Oh, they'd love him. They'd be like, oh, he's a great, he's he's presidential. This is this is hilarious, you know. He, Marx gets so much mileage out of that sausage. You know, it's it's amazing. I mean, this is the thing. This is the thing about like appeals to stability in an unstable time, right? It's like you know, it's crazily hostage to fortune as to like you know which force has the ability to actually make that appeal concrete, right? So the Democrats can say all that they want that you know we just want to get back to normal, but the precise point at this moment is that like we don't know what normal is, and so any <laughs> you know anyone can make speeches like this. Yeah, and I mean, also, normal isn't very popular at this moment. <laughs> so, Kyle, we bring back to the 18th premiere of Joe Biden. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Biden is very much speaking in the way that uh, Louis Napoleon is speaking in, the, in, in that passage. Uh, <laughs> you know? Biden would be like, listen here, Jack. <laughs> oh, man, fucking Joe Biden. Shoot him in the leg, Joe Biden. So what does it mean here, but not the question Brulantes? That w- w- what's he saying that he's uh, ignoring here? Well, he's ignoring the question of like the actual power struggle, right? Like the point about this stuff about tranquility is that it's like passing over 
the conflict between him and Sean Garnier and all the, all the all the stuff that Marx is talking about in the previous passages. If Trump had a if Trump had a be, be like a, a nice wordy gentleman, would the army have gone on the streets? Mm. It would never get to there anyway, so it's kind of a dumb question. But like, uh, no, I, I I don't think so. But the 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 thing is, if Trump had been that and also thought more about the army's makeup and whatever, he probably would not. He probably would have found a way to have the army intervene without directly intervening, which would have been the more likely outcome. Like the military could do some backdoor things. I mean, the, the other thing is, is, and I, I don't want to sound like I'm shitting on people. I don't think these protests are going to go away today or tomorrow, but like the attention for them and the passion for them has already ebbed. And so like the military was probably right in, in, in the side of order to just say, dude, sit on your hands and it'll probably die down. If nothing else, people are going to get sick. Like I, 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 that's the part of the military cynical equation. Like, uh, and I don't think the average soldier would have thought this. I just think like a lot of the average soldier now kind of wants to leave even more than they already did. But the brass would probably just like, you know, let's see what happens in three weeks. Maybe half of these people will be too sick to matter anyway. It's kind of baffling that in, in, in this kind of real political crisis in America, they're not even, not even paying any attention to what's going in the economy. They're not even like, they're not even pretending to do anything or give a shit. It's kind of, it's so baffling. I mean, like, what do people make of that? They're not even holding sessions. Like you were saying, Derek, even if they wanted to do something now, it'd be difficult for them to pass stuff. They well, I the mean, the, the, the Democrats kind of are, but the Republicans are sitting on their hands, I think because they realize that there's a limit to what they can do in the international economy without affecting the national bond rating. And because the continued temporary measures aren't going to be enough, so why not have none? What's what's what will be interesting about that in our time is the states, the, including in particular the GOP states, are going to have a hard time being loyal to the GOP Senate in this because they are fucked in a way that the the Feds are not. I don't. What I don't understand is is this like have they have they bought their own Kool Aid, or do they understand something that we don't get? I think the Democrats kind of do. That's why they've been talking out of their mouth, you know, and in, and in some ways like disempowering the protests by at one point supporting them and encouraging broad scale support, even from like health ministers and well, health officials and shit. We don't have ministers. And at the same time, like being the leaders of the cities who are doing the suppression. And so just hoping that in that mixed messaging, it'll die down. I, I don't know that they're wrong. But the the conflating factor is you're right. They're not they're not like they're not even looking at what the impending economic doom is going to do to all this. Like if you think things are bad now when people are bored, but or at least still have housing, what happens when you have potentially a tenth of the American population become homeless overnight? And I will add that uh, in Canada, since last week, the government has been cracking the whip. They've been, the press and the government have both been going in hard at, so previously the uh, emergency funding that was given to people to support them during the crisis and the stay at home orders was sort of framed as, you know, take it out of an abundance of caution if you receive the money, the worst that's going to happen, like if you receive the money erroneously, the worst that's going to happen to you is you'll have to pay it back. And now they're talking about very uh, high fines and imprisonment for people who receive the, the money incorrectly. Uh, so there's been a switch towards austerity discourse in the last week in Canada. I can't wait till Trudeau gives you the prison problem that we have in the United States. That would be so, that's such a lovely irony. You know, we'll see what happens. I, I wrote I wrote a letter to him last week, an angry <laughs> letter to him. I Seriously. did. Yeah, I said it to him. Yeah. Oh, yeah. For fuck's sake. You're a bigger crank than I am. That's not a crank thing. It's like he's <laughs> threatening to imprison my family. You know, that's that's like, you know, you just an offhand thing you do. You go back on your word and threaten to imprison someone. It's just blow it off steam. You know, I don't ex <laughs> I don't expect that'll affect anything. But it's very yeah. Canadian of you to write a letter because you know what I would want to do. 
but <laughs> my <laughs> wild west frontier Americanism's like, well, there's two ways. There's two ways you handle this. <laughs> one of them does not end well for one party or another. Yeah. Ted Kaczynski over here is going to be mailing bombs. Mail <laughs> bombs. Random bombings are an American tradition, Tom. Oh, that's true. You don't need to talk about an Irish fella about that now, Derek. You're talking to the master here. It, actually, there was a right where my house is in the middle of the country. There, there used to be a, a an RIC barracks there, which is like a Royal Irish constabulary. That was like the British police when they were in charge there and a friend of mine's grandfather uh two friends of mine both their grandfather blew it up in the war of independence and then one of my neighbors built their built their house from the stones of the old barracks i always like that story it's metal as hell isn't it (laughs) i think they were only like 18 and they fucking blew it up i don't know how the fuck they did it but they did it anyway Okay, so let me read this paragraph here. Uh, or Kyle, you go back You go back to work with you, Kyle. You you get this final one to read. All right, all right. The Burgraves of the Party of Order did not delude themselves for a moment concerning the trust that this opening of the heart deserved. About oafs, they had long been blasé. They numbered in their midst veterans and virtuosos of political perjury. Nor had they failed to hear the passage about the army. They observed with annoyance that in its discursive enumeration of lately enacted laws, the message passed over the most important law, the electoral law, in studied silence. And moreover, in the event of there being no revision of the Constitution, left the election of the president in 1852 to the people. The electoral law was the lead ball chained to the feet of the party of order, which prevented it from walking, and so much the more from storming forward. Moreover, by the official disbandment of the Society of December 10th and the dismissal of War Minister Outpul, Bonaparte had, with his own hand, sacrificed the scapegoats on the altar of the country. He had blunted the edge of the expected collision. Finally, the party of order itself anxiously sought to avoid, to mitigate, to gloss over any decisive conflict with the executive power. For fear of losing their conquests over the revolution, they allowed their rival to carry off the fruits thereof. Above all things, France demands tranquility. This was what the party of order had cried to the revolution since February 1848. This was what Bonaparte's message cried to the party of order. Above all things, France demands tranquility. Bonaparte committed acts that aimed at usurpation, but the party of order committed, quote unquote, unrest if it raised a row about these acts and construed them hypochondriacally. The sausages of Satori were quiet as mice when no one spoke of them. Above all things, France demands tranquility. Bonaparte demanded, therefore, that he be left in peace to do as he liked and the parliamentary party was paralyzed by a double fear. The fear of again evoking revolutionary unrest and the fear of itself appearing as the instigator of unrest in the eyes of its own class, in the eyes of the bourgeoisie. Consequently, since France demanded tranquility above all things, the party of order dared not answer war after Bonaparte had talked peace in his message. The public, which had anticipated scenes of great scandal at the opening of the National Assembly, was cheated of its expectations. The opposition deputies, who demanded the submission of the Permanent Commission's minutes on the October events, were outvoted by the majority. On principle, all debates that might cause excitement were eschewed. The proceedings of the National Assembly during November and December 1850 were without interest. Okay, so Napoleon essentially blunted the battle of the charges of the party of order by playing their own game against him. You know, he, like he fi- he forced them into basically backtracking away from looking at the the commission on the permanent commission about the events of he's talking here about the assassination attempts. So basically, they've just completely folded in his in, in to to Napoleon's arguments. Sounds like a line-by-line commentary on the Democrats. (laughs) (laughs) 
to use the obsession with order against the party of order. I mean, as well as the the the, the moment in the middle where he talked about the, the emphasis on elections being the lead ball that prevented it from walking, like that's uh, <laughs> that's definitely that's definitely very apt. I, I just find the like uh, the idea of waiting for this November election <laughs> kind of eerily familiar. Yeah. Like, but like, what, do, uh, what do people think of the like the, say the political state in America currently? About people are just kind of it's like they're all on, on a pausing for just waiting for this event to come in a similar fashion. I think the election itself may be without interest. It, that's kind of my feeling, but I don't know, Derek. What do you think? Like we're fucked. We're so fucked. Like the election will not matter very much. Uh, Trump will Trump will probably lose because the economy is going to go bad, and because he has discredited himself with the elderly, which is kind of fucking amazing. Like that's that's the trend that's been kind of shocking. The short term benefits are clear. Like that we've had the the initial opening up led to an immediate economic like blip but it was a blip of two percent after a loss of what 15 to 20 and and the worst is yet to come and anyone who can see that 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 these band-aids that the democrats and republicans together conjured up to put on the situation is about to fall apart so yeah things are bad it's not clear to me what that anyone's going to care about the election anymore because no one really believes that the democrats are going like you know, the Democrats are going to, like, bend a knee and kinte cloth and talk about shooting people in the legs. Like, who thinks they're going to be able to do shit? Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's going to be, there's basically going to be the gridlock we've seen for the last few years until we get, you know, cue scary music, uh, some other authority, quote unquote, emerging. As of now, it's sort of like all sections of American society are in such disarray that I'm not really sure where it's going to come from. But that, I think, is the trajectory. It, it, it's kind of like just getting you know, to Derek said, like there about like the all the Democrats wearing kente cloth. It, it it sounds like a really crap reboot of the Punisher, where you have Joe Biden wearing like you know an Afro suit and shooting people in the legs. <laughs> oh dear. Maybe, maybe the maybe the public health experts will begin reading fascist books, and uh, you know, uh, <laughs> find ways to scare everyone and. To giving them authority, maybe uh, Deborah Burks will be our new overlord. Well, I do worry about like the liberal tendency to see the non-repressive apparatuses of the state to come in and fix everything. Like like a bunch of teachers, social wor- workers, and community mm-hmm. nurses are going to be able to replace the cops in, in an economic downturn. Like yeah. that's insane. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, you know my my mother was a social worker. And I was talking to her about it and she said, well, you know, the social work, like when I was a social worker and, and since then, the social workers have basically been bullied into performing police duties anyway. Like they're a part of the appre- uh, the repressive apparatus. Same they're, thing they're, with the schools, really. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and I know when people say all these things about social workers and teachers, they mean some kind of platonic ideal of health and education, but you have to work with the state you have and not with the state you haven't. Mm-hmm. Well, unless you smash it, smash it, smash it, smash it yeah, up. Yeah, exactly. Smash it up. Yeah. You know what's funny is I was like, you know, well, according to people in, in Seattle, there's some kind of SoundCloud rapper warlord that everyone keeps referring to. So maybe that is the future. It's yeah. like those, those guys in New York, the models giving the headshots to the crowd, to, to the police, <laughs> the brand ambassador, uh, insurrectionary. Did anybody read about all the fakery with that Black Panther crew in Atlanta? How oh, she was an actress. I was reading about that. The funny thing about them is I knew they were reactionary and sketch from the beginning because they're a split of a split of the new Black Panther Party, which itself was a black supremacist organization that split from the nation of Islam and was completely disowned by most of the vocal Panthers. And then you read that like they get actors involved in shit and, and then they do like posing with the cops. And it's just like, with friends like these, who needs Cohen Telpro? Like you really don't. Yeah. 
people are also kind of, I think, understating the continuity with the original Black Panthers with that stuff, you know. No, no, uh, somebody says, no, they're not MBPP. No, they weren't New Black Panther. I'm going to respond to that. They weren't New Black Panthers. They're New Black Panther revolutionaries. They, they may or may not be inspired by some shit with the MBP. It's been actually hard for me to follow up on. I do know, however, that the most of the people who were at the actual rallies had nothing to do with the other with the group that called itself that name, and they were mostly actors and people posing. Those type of people must be getting money from somewhere. Got to be getting some weird ass money from some some weirdos. I mean, well, the thing here's the thing is there. It's hard to tell right now, and one of the things is the social media discourse doesn't help on it. But then people on the left tend to tend to like defend this shit. I actually resent having to talk about it. I don't think any of that matters no. at all. It's largely a fucking distraction. And even in Seattle, where you have this massive issue of like disparity in these super rich cities, it is very interesting to me that leftists are fucking afraid of talking about how different the situation is in like Seattle, the Bay in New York than it is in, in Minneapolis and St. Paul, because you're dealing with average incomes that are like an order of magnitude different. The other thing is in these areas that you see the second wave, they're predominantly white by like 80%. Like that's not discussed. People don't want to discuss it. And it's, it's actually kind of making me mad. It is something that's very frustrating for me because in, in a place like Minneapolis, we should be talking about like that attempt to run hotels and how they got sabotaged by trying to do progressive drug policy and, you know, do, do like clean needles. And then they have one overdose because they run out of Narcan and they get shut down. Like it, when Occupy in London here, what they did to really uh, screw it up is that the, the, the police kept on dropping off loads of people with d- drug problems and homeless people and telling them to go there, you know, systemically. And I think any any of these places that start doing this type of stuff, you know, just look to the what they did in the revolution in Egypt. They released all the prisoners. This, these are tactics that will be enacted by uh, the state when if, if they feel like they need to. Yeah, you, to speak on that Egypt stuff, I, I remember talking to a former Brotherhood member um, who left um, because of how bad they had handled the situation afterwards. But they, they told me, like, yeah, the, the military stood on its hands and the police did all kinds of shit. But then the military started actively throwing disorder into the into society, actively in, uh, encouraging insane anti-Semitic conspiracies about Israel while also taking Israel's stance towards the Palestinians more seriously and, and stuff like that. Like, I think we're going to see a lot of that. I think we're going to see a lot of, like, bat fuckery in our own ranks. That are, is like, it'll be like low-level cop interference. I mean, you know, one of the things is you, you will also see a lot of like workers try to shit on the Chaz situation. And I, I'm not optimistic about Chaz either, but like the economics of the United States cities are so fucking weird. So you either have massive gentrification problems that leads to things like Seattle and the Bay Area. And so like the intermediary working class with the quote unquote middle class is largely leaving those areas because they can't afford to live there. But poor people can't leave. They can't afford to leave. You know, like they're very, very poor. So you have like this increasing gap in those areas. And so you have weird radicalism where you have like a strand of progressively educated, like not like would be workers, uh, would be or maybe even would be bourgeoisie, frankly, would be high end workers who are unemployed and leading this stuff. And then you have this like big pool of people who have been completely shut out but are stuck in the area. And um, that's definitely the case in Seattle. That's the case in the Bay Area. That seems to be somewhat the case in New York, although that the, they seem to handle it better. But that's a very different thing than like Minneapolis and St. Paul. If people know America, Minneapolis and St. Paul have been deracinated for a long fucking time. They're poor cities now. Aren't They're they? poor cities. Most of the most of the industrial heartland is fucking hollowed out, and so it hasn't been surprising to me that you've seen the shift of racial struggle from these hollowed out heartland cities. That was also true for Ferguson, by the way. Like, look at the map. Like, from the South, which has also been largely deracinated, but has been dealing with this for so much longer and is so much more demoralized and co-opted. And and then what happens next is it moves to these kind of richer cities where the, where the disparity is so much larger 
But it also seems like like one of the things you'll notice is the language of the stuff coming out of Minnesota is not an activist language where the language and the stuff coming out of Seattle is. And I'm not saying that inherently is a sign of it being bad or fake or anything or that I'm not that condescending, but it does tell you that like there's an educated left-wing subculture that at least has some sway on that stuff in Seattle and the Bay and in New York that it doesn't have in Minneapolis. One of the things that I have been thinking about that's different from our time than the Brumaire is that in the Brumaire, the left was like, like Blanc was literally trying to like have a, an educational dictatorship <laughs> during this time period, right before this led up to like train the working class to vote the right way. Didn't that sound like Joe Biden? It's the weirdest pink authoritarian shit, right? And they got totally sidelined. But the left in our time is in even more disarray. Like that was a left that hadn't come together yet. And now we're dealing with a left that has decayed largely since the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, as a person in the chat did ask me what I mean by activist language, like if you see the second list of demands for some of the autonomous, and it may be fake, who fucking knows? It's hard to tell. From the Seattle Chaz commune, like the, the minority list, it is written totally in like a critical race theory talk and stuff that you don't see in the same way from like the people seizing hotels in Minneapolis and trying to serve homeless people. Yeah, I'd say regarding Chaz that it's kind of similar to the commune in a sense because it's a situation where state authority has vacated an area and then activists come in and set something up. It seems to be what's happened. I don't know exactly how it's all going to go down, but yeah, I don't, I don't think it's going to survive that long. I do hope there's something positive that comes out of it. And I do hope that it's not such a, it's not the disaster that the commune was. Well, I mean, the, we have to talk about the intermediary forms of the Arab Spring and Occupy both tried the same things. Just Occupy never could get of any, anything significant to the state. Right, Sakati Sup uh, Park is not Capitol Hill, but it it feels very similar. Yeah, yeah. It's just that the state never really explicitly vacated that area. Right. And, and in this case, they did. And so there was the declaration of autonomy that could be made and have some limited credibility, which is already blown, right? Because the police chief was in there the other day, just right. like walking around. I, I think also like on like these things are only performative unless the actual working class are doing it. I mean, as in all the working like in Paris, like it was all the workers took control, you know. And here we have like some activists in a particular area take control, and it's just a it's a different phenomenon. Sorry, Tom. What do you mean by all the working class? Because that's like that seems like a ridiculously high standard. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. And when I say all, I mean. Uh, I'm being pejorative slightly, but you know what I mean? As in like the mass of the workers took control of like a large part of the city, say in, in, in the, in the commune where here it's like people probably that don't really even live there. There's probably not even businesses there. It seems more like, you know, administrative center of part. I tell me if I'm wrong. I, 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 I don't there know. Are, there are businesses in the area that are like, still carrying on business. Okay. But like, it, it doesn't sound like, the Paris Commune, you know what I mean? It's like no, I mean one of the things thing. is it can't reproduce. Like it can't re like Capitol Hill in Seattle doesn't have anything you could seize to reproduce itself. You know Neither I mean? did Paris, to be fair. Like well, they started the eating rats. You know, I mean, well, well I mean, that's one of the things about the Commune is like it seems so obvious in the <laughs> in the hindsight that there was no way it could survive. I'm not saying this, that the mayor of Seattle has studied the Paris Commune at all, but it does seem like a logical tactical retreat to just go, let them have it, hope they burn it down. If they don't, give them three weeks, wait till national media attention isn't on them. And if you have to crush it, do it after the larger waves of media attention are over. Because one of the things I think we might find with this one is if it, if it survives, it will be crushed, but they'll wait to do it until national national media attention is somewhere else. Like they they could wait. They they might wait a long time as well to crush it. They could literally wait six months, wait till Joe Biden's in there, and then do it like when there's like Super Bowl is on or something. It's not even clear that they're going to have to crush it. 
right? It's possible that just collapses out of internal tensions. That's what they hope. I mean, and one of the things that I've pointed out about COINTELPRO, COINTELPRO generally worked that way. The exception was the Panthers and actually right-wing movements where they actively, you know, would do shit to get people killed. But most of the time, they just try to accelerate internal tension so that things would fall apart on their own. And there are plenty of those to accelerate, right? I mean, it's just a thing on, on what, what Tom was saying about the workers. I feel like, I mean, although I, I don't disagree, like you need to have some ability to lay your hands on something that could reproduce your revolt. I feel like, though, that's a little bit of putting the cart before the horse. Like the, the, the whole problem that everyone's trying to solve is that we don't have that least in places that, you know, where revolts and uprisings take place, or at least places where like left wing action, you know, seems to happen. So that so the problem that everyone's trying to solve on the left and has been trying to solve for a long time is how do you, you know, how do you solve how do you deal with the fact that the places in which you can do anything like left politics are totally distanced from the places that are actually important to get social control, right? Well, I mean, I've been pointing that out for a while that I'm afraid that like the abandonment of the Rust Belt and these deracinated and somewhat slightly more egalitarian, but downwardly so areas of the United States have been largely abandoned by leftists because they don't feel like they can talk to those people. And that's yet where the epicenter of these like BLM comes out of that and then moves to the other areas, partly because remaining in that kind of activist mode is fucking deadly. And even in the United States, that'll get you killed. Whereas you can be a community activist in a major city, you know, talking about Black Lives Matter as adjacent to the Democratic Party, and you might even make money from it. And like, I can't even blame people for taking that gambit, you know? I wouldn't want to risk it either. Yeah, I mean, on the on the other, I agree with what you just said, Derek. On the other side, there's like, an equal problem with people in cities talking about the need to, you know, go to the Rust Belt, which is true. Like that's 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 an important. That's the thing people have to do. But it just ignores the fact that like there's a reason people in the left are in cities. What's the reason? I mean, I agree with you, but what's the reason why they're in affluent cities? Affluent cities. Well, I mean, leftist radicalization is largely a product of like you know university milieus now more and more. Um, and media, media hubs. Yeah, exactly. So the left that we have is not the left that we want. Yes, exactly. Right. But like, look, look, what's the what percentage of the U.S. population would you say right now are politics are similar, either like commie, revolutionary socialists, or even just radical social democrats? Almost impossible to tell. Like, I mean, it, it's impossible <laughs> oh. to tell because a lot of people using those words actually mean very milk toast things by them but i know but just just your general just a general would you say uh, it's 10 maybe, maybe two percent radical and then ten percent adjacent yeah yeah so like if that's the truth and we know that all like most of the radicals you know just look at who listens to my podcast most of them are college educated a lot of times live in cities that are the richer cities so it's like because our actual movement is so small and it's concentrated into these small areas, it's just it's a sign of the weakness of our movement currently. You know, it's Agreed. like these these things like Chaz and Occupy are a function of the weakness. That's really what they are. In the local groups here in SLC, I'm not just talking about like Marxist groups or whatever. I'm actually talking about like groups mostly of color. Like there were circling the Raggins against each other, like calling out official BLM and then like who had the right to do that? You know, could white people call out official BLM? It, it was it was so it was so disheartening. And it it took it took literally a week to get to that state. And then when you know, and so I'm listening to you on like your your sleep deprived ecstasy, and then my experience of it here, it's just like, man, we're so fucked. Like, like we can't stop arguing with each other over the pettiest of shit immediately. But I would, I would think, Derek, it's it's like that thing that Mark said earlier in one of the chapters. Where was it about the the pure Republicans? Where he was talking about like how if they were going to make the thing that they stood on against Napoleon something to do with the army, the army would never back them unless 
the thing was so important. And I think that similarly with all these, you know, us in us, us too, including us and how we behave and all that. It's a function of kind of the meaninglessness of what we're doing is that we don't unite. And I think that like that stuff will dissipate. It will dissipate not to, I'm not saying it'll all go, but I think the tendency will when things get serious and real that it will bring together those that, that are currently apart to a large extent or just split them off, you know, actually make them an enemy as opposed to just this rubbish in, you know, I would agree with you too, but I I keep on wondering if that's going to happen soon enough before like repression happens. And that's what I've been feeling lately is like that, that the real movement isn't quite there yet. There's still a whole lot of neutral people. I mean, one of the things I can tell you here, and I'm in the teachers union, it's the teachers union has not said a fucking word about any of this. Nothing. It's been... Why is that, do you think? Because, one, I mean, the teachers union here is much more conservative than most of the rest of the country, considering who's going to make it up. But, um, two, I think also, like, there's an ambivalence. Like, most teachers don't love cops. They don't, like, the the people that, particularly if you're teaching in a city and not in the suburbs, the people that that you're serving are the people whose parents are getting their heads cracked in by the police, but at the same time, like, there's a huge distrust between you and those communities a lot of the time. You're not from that community in most of these areas. I mean, it even rationally, like, if I was a first-generation college student and, for, you know, from a background that was impoverished, the immigrant or, or of color, would I fucking become a teacher? No, I'd go make some real money or get some real power. I'd become a lawyer or a, or a business owner. Like, come on. So like, that's a, that's kind of an issue where I'm at. And so they're strategically quiet about it. And we don't really know what to do about the fact that like in the United States, I don't know the percentage, but I'm, I'm actually assuming the FOP, the fraternal, the fraternal order of police is a high percentage of the 17% unionization of the country. I know the largest is the teachers unions and then there's nursing unions and those are both very large. And I'm suspecting that after that, it's the, it's the police unions. The thing is, even like in most states that ban, because there are some states that ban um, public sector unions, they have to call themselves associations and can't do a lot of union y stuff. The, the FOP still exists. I just think, like, I, I don't know how much the repression mm-hmm. will be, Derek, to be honest with you, because I don't think the threat is that big. It, it, yeah. Is it of a similar order to the 1960s? What would you call the 1960s race movement or the? Yeah, well, they were called the, the civil rights. There's the ghetto riots and the civil the rights movement. Yeah, you know, we're talking about like when the when the when the capitalist state gets really threatened, it's when there is a workers' revolutionary movement, and that doesn't exist yet. It's there's a sock dem kind of movement, and there's a small bit, and there's some race stuff going on as well. So I don't think the repression is going to be much worse than the COINTELPRO 70s repression, unless things really kick off in the next few months, which, they, know, they, which they really could. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the fact that these grew up so big seems like, to be related to the fact that we're in an economic crisis and no one has anything to do. <laughs> like, That's in a way the, the slightly worrying thing that, you know, how much of this is going to, how much of this, I sometimes worry that a lot of the unrest is like, you know, people getting the chance to go outside and how much of that is going to remain in a kind of reopen, more relaxed environment. Like how much of the unrest is going to be channeled into (laughs) people going back into restaurants and stuff. I mean, that's a, so that sounds a bit flippant, but like, I'm sure we can imagine less frivolous examples than restaurants. One thing I have noticed though, online, just from my weirdo Twitter view is that like the number of like leftists who are now saying oh you, you gotta buy some guns <laughs> that has gone up a fuck load well i mean i you know, i gave up guns 10 years ago and i am definitely thinking about picking them back up again so well you just put them down the ground 10 years ago and now you're going to pick them up again yeah i put them down because i didn't feel like i was gonna i, I don't believe in holding a gun unless you intend to ki- unless you intend to kill people so you know I wasn't in the killing people phrase of mind. So like I wasn't going to have a gun and, and I didn't figure I would need it. And now I don't, I don't feel that that is true anymore. Like, and 
if things get really chaotic, I might need it. No, do I think like the Socialist Rifle Association is going to leave a workers' revolution? No, because the state can bomb us in thirty seconds. Not delusional like like libertarian militia nuts, but we do need to be realistic about like counterforce and social instability and then like random right wing weirdos attacking us because that whole leaderless resistance is good for one thing and that's generating terrorism and there's a lot of it. On this episode, you heard the team tune The Order of the Phronic Jesters and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. The artwork for the show was created by the Korean artist and author of the 2019 Marx Engels illustration book. You can check out links to his work and Twitter account in the show notes. Thank you for listening and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science and Swampside Chats. (laughs) 